Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Here, that just made me think of something. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine. I'm not the only one that knows that, right? <laughs> Don't you just love when you're a kid and your parent came in singing that to you? Oh, so nice. All right, let's stand together. Welcome to Hosanna this morning. If you're joining us online, good morning to you as well. Let's stand as you're able. And we're going to read together Psalm 148, verses 1 through 13. I'll read the leader part, and you are the people. <laughs> yes, you are. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens, and you waters above the sky. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord. Stormy winds that do this in. Praise the Lord, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children. And all of us say, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His His splendor splendor is above above the earth and the heavens. Now, when you think about praising God, do you think about the sun, the moon, the earth, the seas, the animals, and so on, all giving praise to God as well? Do you think about that? Well, what does that look like to you? Like, how does the moon give praise to God? Oh, I heard the answer. Perhaps just by being the moon, right? Because God created it. All it has to do is move and shine as it was created. Or perhaps by bringing us joy when we look at it and reminding us of God's power and greatness. So we're going to teach you a new song this morning, and it's called A Thousand Hallelujahs as we continue to God give God our praise.
us, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, there are things of this world that we can often tempt us. You know, money tempts us, power, approval, our appearance, just to name a few things. Living for these things can leave us feeling empty. When we put aside the lesser things, we can redirect our focus on the greater things. But not something, someone greater. Matthew 6, verse 33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So let's continue in worship as we sing this song better. Filling in the space for us. <laughs> Give God the praise, yes. King around these walls 
but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won, for you have never
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hazan on this beautiful, warm summer day. Hot. I guess it's a little more than warm. Yes, it's quite hot, but uh, I'm just glad the sun shines out. Had some really beautiful weather. So welcome to everybody. My name is Kelly. Um, I'm the children's ministry director here and just uh, want to say hi to everybody online with us and everybody here. Um, we have a number of announcements today. Are the ushers around? Oh, they're kind of gathering, so we'll give them a few minutes to gather, and I'll make a few of the announcements a while. Um, those of you who live in Lidditz, maybe if you don't live in Lidditz, you know of a, a store lo local here, locally here that's called Matthew 25, and it's a, a, a thrift shop, for lack of a better word, um, that sells all kinds of things, clothes and housewares, and um, I've found some really great treasures there. And the really cool thing about Matthew 25 is that they donate 100% of what they of what they bring in to um, meet emergency needs, to bless different ministries. And they have donated to date over three million dollars, which is outstanding. Three million dollars. And. Um, over the years, Hosanna has been a recipient of um, some of that money, and just last week, we received a check in the mail for $1,000. So, yeah, so let's give Matthew 25 um, a round of applause. And, and if, if you haven't checked it out, check it out, because there are some really, um, you can really find some good finds there. Um, I think that our ushers are now in place and ready, so uh, join me in a word of prayer as they get ready to accept our offering. Oh, Heavenly Father, um, you do never fail us. You are here um, in the good times and the not so good times, um, in the sun and the rain, you are present. And we just thank you for that gift of your presence um, and your love that just permeates everything. We saw that this week in VBA and I thank you for all of the people that were involved in that this week um, and for your presence here because kids were definitely touched and felt your love. We ask the blessing on the gifts that we are about to give, that they may be, be used wisely, and we thank you for the many gifts you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. So the ushers will take your offering now. Um, the Change for Change offerings for the month of July, August, and September are going to go to our friends uh, Harry and Penka in Bulgaria, and they use those monies to buy uh, Christmas gifts for their Operation Christmas Child, or their shoebox. Uh, Operation Shoebox, so uh, any change for change you have, um, feel free to drop that in the offering bucket. We would appreciate that. Um, this has been a heck of a week. Uh, we finished up on Thursday uh, with our Vacation Bible Adventure, and um, I have the privilege of giving you kind of a rundown of the week and um, just some of my, my thoughts as I've kind of pondered things over the last couple days and, and revisited everything. So... Um, one of the first things I was thinking about, and, and I'm gonna talk for a few minutes, so bear with me, but, but a week like we just had bears talking about and, and having those of you who weren't present understand what this, the ministry of this church means to the community. First of all, so my husband and I started attending and my family started attending Hosanna in August of 2014. And I was thinking about that this week because in 20, I believe it was 2016, I was asked, if I was interested in directing a Christmas musical for kids. And I really wanted to say yes, because I had done that in our previous church and, and I really enjoyed that. But my biggest fear and my biggest hindrance to saying yes was I didn't have a team. And you need a team to do something like that. And I had left a place where I had a team. I didn't know too many people here. Well, here we are in 2022 and I have a team. And um, yeah, I get very emotional about it because a, an effort like VBA does not happen without a team. And it took a full team to, to pull off last week. As you came in, um, and if you haven't seen it, I encourage you, I put a little bulletin board together out there at the end of the week and I have listed all of the names of people that contributed to VBA in any way from buying a yard sign to making cookies to um, donating money to helping the week of VBA. How many names do you think are on that list? 76. Okay, with me, that's 77. 77 people. Um, and please show me grace if I forgot you. I did really, really hard. I, I worked hard to, to not. But, um, and then there's some anonymous people. I know that somebody donated snacks for VBA and we found a $50 folded up bill underneath it to be used for um, VBA snacks. 
So those kind of things happen, and they happen behind the scenes that we don't see. And I am eternally grateful for the team that I have. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that team. And I, and I don't have time to call everybody out individually. We'd be here the entire service. Um, but there's a couple, couple of groups I'd like to, to um, shout, give a shout out to. Our um, group of um, individuals that made us meals every night. I think we have a little picture, not a little picture, but a picture of them. There they are, and working very hard right there. But, um, and they didn't know I was gonna do that, so they might be mad at me for that, but um, they fed all of us volunteers every night. Didn't just feed us, like healthy food. Um, I think many of us were depressed on Friday when nobody was here to make us dinner. No, I didn't know what I was gonna do on Friday. I'm like, who's making me dinner tonight? Because. Every day we came in and had this wonderful meal, so I thank them. Um, this one gets me, because um, there's another group, the youth of this church, many of whom I have known since they were in kids' ministry. They stepped up in a huge way this year. Um, I'm gonna talk, don't show that picture yet, Jeff. Okay, there you can show it. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. He, so that's some of them. Um, that's the worship team that I'm going to talk about in a second. But there was other youth as well. And these kids helped at worship. And then they quick changed. And they ran off to be with kids. And not only were they with kids, they were amazing with these children. I had about four of these youth helpers in with preschoolers. I could not have asked for better youth and better compassion to be shown. I mean, we've got a lot to be proud of here. Yeah, um, it was just so moving. And you know, sometimes, I don't know, Jared, if you experience it, it can be squirrely at times. Yeah, but, but really this week they weren't. Like they were really focused and they just showed up and did what they had to do. And this, this particular group right here is not a picture of all the youth, but this particular group is our shining stars. And they were our worship team for VBA. Um, you see the NASA shirts they have on. You think you know what NASA stands for, but I would have to say you're wrong this for last week because NASA stood for Norby Adventure Space Academy. So they flew in from Norby Adventure Space Academy every night and led our kids in worship, um, related well with the kids. I have, have nine people that want to do that next year. Nine people, including a rising third grader that doesn't even go to church here that came up and pulled me over to meet her mom and said, tell my mom what I have to do to be one of them. Aww. Tell my mom what I have to do. And she doesn't even go, to, they go to a different church and I said, well, keep coming. And when you age out of VBA, we'll find a spot for you there. But nine kids, so I don't know, the stage will be full next year. Um, so I really thank them all for their hard work. Um, thank you to everyone who led groups, led crafts, games, lesson, snacks. You need to hear everything that's involved in this. Those who helped with registration, decorating, parking, multimedia. Um, Jeff was our mission control specialist, so he rolled with me every night, no matter what I ask of him, which I appreciated. And then everyone who helped uh, with all the details that made it run smoothly, bell ringers, photographer, Chris Poggier entertaining the kids in here for 30 minutes. It was like a three ring circus in here. Um, the half hour before, and Chris did a great job at that. Um, people that baked cookies, Sandy Cobus, I heard a comment Sunday night that you knocked it out of the park with your sugar cookies and decorations. But people just showed up and, and did such a great job. Um, I'd like to just share with you a few moments that happened with the kids. Um, this year's theme is Norby, N-O-R-B-E, and that stood for Non-Organic Robot Buddy Explorer Class. And uh, Norby came to us every night uh, to teach us about God's faithfulness and how his glory is out of this world. <laughs> you remember Norby, right? <laughs> Norby the robot. Yep, there's Norby the robot. And along with Norby, there was a, a cat called, um, I messed this up many times last week, <laughs> Captain Crank, that's right. And Captain Crank showed up every night to try to derail us from our mission. And I think it was the second or third night, there was a little girl sitting down here, and she, she got her hand up, she got her hand up, and so I called on her, and she said, I went down in the sweetest voice, she said, I think I know why Captain Crank is so cranky. And I said, why is that? And she said, I think it's because he doesn't know God. And I was like, oh. 
you know, the next night she said she had more of a theory, and her theory the second night was that I think he had a bad childhood. <laughs> that, was her, that was her second. Um, so, just so sweet um, what they say. Um, we talked about God's faithfulness, his power, his forgiveness, his compassion. We talked about his compassion being in action, that we do things. And um, two, it was many acts of compassion, but one involved a parent that, wasn't, that don't even attend our church. Um, Bud Strom, I think you've been in our parking lot for how many years? 20-some? 20 20-some 20 years, Bud's out there directing traffic, and we have a, it's a well-oiled machine out there, and um, Deb was sharing that a mom came in, and we had a new pickup procedure this year, so she went out to get her card to, um, we, well, we thought that's why she went out. Deb said, did you forget something? And she said, well, there's a gentleman out in the parking lot who told me he's been here 20 plus years, and he's never gotten to see the ending of VBA, so I wanna go out and relieve him so he can come in to see that. And I, and I think Bud very graciously you know, thanked her and said, it's okay for this year, we'll work it out last year. But she didn't even go to our church. Wow. And she went out there and offered to let him come in and see that. And I thought, that's, that's compassion in action. Um, Jeff, the picture of the kids out at Norby, um, uh, and Norby you saw out here when you come in, there's a little slot in Norby there, and that's where the kids put their offering every night. And this was the preschool group. We do not have them tied up. That's not what that <laughs> rope is. But they... They hold on to a rope as they travel around so none wander off. But um, that's Michaela Cookie there in the green shirt. She was, came all the way from Texas to help us. And she led these kids out and like almost all of them had like a dollar bill in their hand. And they wanted to go put it in Norby. And so we, we really make an effort of letting the kids do that, to, to let them learn what it's like to give and um, to give in the name of God. And one thing that happened on, I believe it was Wednesday night, Deb's grandson Dylan Helt bit into a cookie, wasn't one of yours, Sandy's, but bit into a cookie and spit it out and said, it's hard, I, I can't eat this. He spit his tooth out. He lost his tooth when he spit into the cookie and he was like, he spit it out. So the tooth fairy came that night and Dylan came in the next day and the money that he got from the tooth fairy, he put in Norby. Yeah, so kids are getting it. They're getting what it means to give. They're getting what it means to be the hands and feet of God. And um, yeah, I will just never forget that as well. So with the money that went into Norby, we raised $1,000, $1,000 that um, we have been able to bless five families in the Lidditz community with. Um, and I had the privilege of visiting some of those families yesterday. and. The gratitude is almost, um, they, they can't talk, you know. Um, there's, there's tears, there's hugs, there's gratitude. And uh, I made it, you know, very clear that it came from our kids and our families at our Vacation Bible Adventure. So I'm very grateful to, to all of you for that support. Um, I could probably go on and on, but um, two surprises for you, maybe not surprises, but we'd like to share two things with you. One, we'd like to share our Vacation Bible Adventure week video with you. Um, you'll see our kids and our youth in, at action here. And then after that, all the way from NASA, the shining stars have returned today. And they're going to come up with a, a lot of the kids are here, a number of the kids are here from VBA. I'd like to invite them up, not yet, but I'll have them come up and they wanna do two songs for you that uh, they learned at VBA this week about the power of God and the goodness of God. So before that, let's watch the video made by Lauren King. Excellent, excellent. So thank you again to everybody. Um, again, you all mean the world to me. Thank you for making it a great week. Thank all of you. I'll see you next year, right? Right, next year? Yes, that's what I like to hear. Okay, great. Now, kids, you can head out to, to Sunday school and youth, you can head out with Jared to uh, youth group. I think they know that God's power, power, powerful Kelly Wentz will don't go anywhere. <laughs> no, you can't sit down. <laughs> you know, she has thanked everyone for everything they did last week. But this woman is amazing. She held it all to, yeah. She held it all together all week, stinking hot, 
took care of everyone's needs. And I think probably by the end of the week, she was tired of hearing her name. She wished she probably could change it from Kelly to anything else. But Kelly did a fantastic job. We had, a, the adults, we had a blast. We had such a good week. The kids absolutely loved being here, love you, and we're just grateful to have Kelly as our children's director. So thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you. Wow, it's hard to just swing into the next part of our service, isn't it? I just keep wondering, woo, yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, our speaker this morning is no stranger to our platform because she's spoken from this platform several times. Jane and Larry Clark have been with us here at Hosanna for over four years. Jane was born in West Texas, and she has quite the list of accomplishments, which is really pretty awesome, and I just want to share them with you. Jane has earned a BS in sociology, an MA in humanities, MA in literature and history, an MA in Spiritual Formation and Direction, a PhD in English Literature and Composition. She also holds certificates in directing the Ignatian Exercises in Somatic Trauma Release and Trauma Therapy. And in October, she's gonna receive her Certificate in Sacred Activism of the Global Mystics. She's a retired journalist and professor of writing, journalism, and literature. And Jane, I was trying to figure out how many writing groups that you've led here at Hosanna. Four? And there's one coming up that she's going to tell you about in just a few minutes. And also, she has a manuscript under consideration for a book titled, I love this title, Cowgirl Dharma, the West Texas Wade Women, because Jane's former last name was Wade. So Jane, come on up and give us what you got this morning. Top Jane? <laughs> okay, one, two, three. Good morning, everyone. I am really humbled and honored to be here. Um, especially humbled because this is such a hardworking group of people. My goodness, you all amaze me, and these children, the energy. So I'm going to actually bring it down a notch. <laughs> cool down the temperature just a little bit. First, I want to just say, put in a plug for the writing workshop that will begin on August 9th. Uh, we're going to be writing family stories. And I know, I, I can see your eyeballs glazing over already, <laughs> that you all have family stories. Um, I got this idea actually after reading Tony's new book. And oh my goodness, Tony, if you're listening, forgive me for forgetting the title. <laughs> but it's about his adventurous uh, grandparent, grandfathers and great-grandfathers. It's very good. And I would, I would really recommend, if you have a chance to get it, to get it and read it. It's a quick read, um, easy to follow, um, simple dance steps, <laughs> all of that. <laughs> but, we will, do, we will kind of follow that platform that he's used. Um, Tony has used history to frame his family's experience and to kind of pose some questions that he has about his family dynamics. And you don't have to be a writer, and you certainly don't have to be a historian to come to this workshop. Um, trust me, we're going to use just different types of approaches to frame your stories. And if you just trust me, I will get you there. All you have to do is show up with the story and keep in mind that you are the expert on your own story. So I promised I was going to bring it down just a little bit and cool the temperature off. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about gospel as a manual for survival, something I think we could use right now. Years ago, I taught technical writing at Penn State, was one of my classes. And my students in the technical writing class were mostly engineers, 
and they did not like to write. And they told me so, usually on the first night. <laughs> they had to produce all the typical academic research pieces, but I tried very hard to design assignments that would be useful to them in their fields. One of them asked the writers to produce an uh, instruction manual, a guide that would instruct readers to perform a task or a procedure. Now this could be simple, as basic as changing a tire, assembling a product, repairing an object, or it could be as difficult and challenging as writing a software program. But they had to create a step-by-step -step explanation that would lead the readers to the completion of the entire procedure. That might sound like an easy task, but pretty soon those engineers could see that this assignment was complex. It was especially challenging for mechanical engineers. Since, you know, they work with machines. And they had to show their readers in writing, just basic text, how to use a machine or a system that was made up of multiple parts. So first of all, they had to explain the purpose of the system and how it should work. They had to make a list of parts, create a diagram of the equipment, write steps in an easy to follow order. They had to provide a troubleshooting section that dealt with safety and other problems. Most importantly, maybe, they had to motivate their users to follow the plan. Because how many of you really read the instructions? I, yeah, I don't. Only if I'm lost, then I go back and read the instructions. Now this is before we had YouTube. So they also had to create illustrations. Well, I've got to tell you, when they turned in their first drafts, they looked like very basic to-do lists. And they started off with step number one, turn it on. <laughs> step two, push the record button. Step three, record. Number four, push the stop record button. And five, push the power button to turn off the device. Obviously, they had to revise. This whole assignment took several weeks, and it took a lot of precise planning on the students' part. And they soon came to see that writing an instruction manual was one of the biggest, toughest, most challenging assignments they'd ever complete. But they learned how to connect with their readers. After all, these readers would not be able to call them up with questions if they had a problem. And they had to instill confidence in their readers by making them comfortable and literally inviting them in to participate. So as I thought about this week's message, I was reminded that we are, all of us, trying to perform something very challenging in this life. We're using a pretty complex system, too, a body and a mind to achieve something important. And we're doing so without an, an instruction manual. As Christians, we're trying to follow a life that will lead us into the kingdom of God a place we have never seen, to a God we cannot fully see or know. And just like the readers of my students' instruction manuals, we can't pick up the phone or send a text message to God with questions when we get into trouble. We can pray and ask for guidance, but I don't know about you, I don't ever get a direct response. Not anything that resembles instructions I could get in a manual. Now I need help with this every day. 
how to live a Christ-like life. I need it all the time. After all, we're living in a dangerous world right now. Let's be clear about that. Wars, mass shootings, political problems, loss of family and friends, a plague, problems with the climate, and those rising gas and grocery prices. It's been a pretty awful time. Every single day, we're watching tragedy, and it's overwhelming. But I'd like to suggest to you that, in fact, we do have an instruction manual to help us survive these times. That manual is the gospel, and it appears in the Bible in the form of the commandments, the Beatitudes, parables, words of the prophets, the wisdom books of the Bibles, as well as several other books like Psalms that teach us how to pray. Granted, we don't get photos like the instructions that come from Ikea, but we are given something of a template for living. And if we pay attention to this gospel, we might be okay. Let's look at the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount to see what we can find. Now this is a pretty, just a little bit of the list. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is one of my favorites. This goes on, and it doesn't read like an instruction manual. But in this section, we learn what's expected of us if we want to enter the kingdom of God. So we're not told explicitly how to behave, but we are told in a very clear way that behaving Christ-like is our way. That's what we should follow. Theologian N.T. Wright tells us in his lecture, Simply Jesus, that if God blesses the world, it will be done through people who are meek, through people who are humble. God will bless those who long for his presence, those who through their behavior demonstrate a need for the divine. The words in the Beatitudes are part of this gospel survival manual. And in these lines, God is reaching across the page to encourage us to follow his instructions. So if, as Wright suggests, God will do his work through people, I'd suggest that as God's people, we are also carriers of the gospel. We are people and instruments of grace, and we carry the manual in our souls. So if we were to turn this manual into a set of instructions on how to live a Christ-like life, how would we do it? We might begin with a list of equipment, and based on N.T. Wright's claim that God uses us we would need to list ourselves as the first piece of equipment. So our manual might include two parts, two major parts. One, a soul, and two, a body. Now our need for a soul might be pretty obvious, but why a body? We need a body, because as theologian and author Megan Watterson tells us, we are embodied souls. The human body is the soul's chance to be here. We need a brain, too, a good functioning mind, but more often than not, it's the brain that gets us into trouble. And it's the soul that leads us to follow the behavior that God desires of us. 
The soul is here because it carries God's instructions and the body carries the soul. Let's think about these two pieces of equipment, body and soul, a little bit more. Our bodies are the sacred containers of the soul. What a job description to be the container that carries the soul, the gospel. What a privilege. We are privileged. And what a challenge. Because, ironically, living or behaving our way into the kingdom of God is made much more challenging by the fact that we are biological, incarnated human beings. We have a complicated relationship with our bodies. They don't always work very well. We have illness, allergies, injuries. Some of us can't sleep. Some can't sit still. I'm not looking at anybody, by the way. <laughs> Others have trouble focusing on tasks, although that's probably more a function of the brain. We have heart conditions. We get COVID, cancer. We can't stop smoking. We need help with our vision, with walking, hearing, bearing children. And we can't seem to control our weight. I know almost no one for whom this is not an issue. In fact, it's estimated by market researchers that Americans spend, spend more than $60 billion a year to lose weight. Can you imagine what Hosanna would do with just a bit of that money? In one way or another, we deal with our bodies every single day, yet we don't really appreciate the role our bodies play in our spiritual growth. Everyone I know believes that if they just felt better or had more energy or quit having panic attacks or feel less pain, life would be better. So we expect a lot of our bodies to keep us happy. And one of the problems this causes is that we are very dependent on the pharmaceutical industry. Pun is intended there. In America, we spend so much money on medication. The American Academy of Actuaries reports that in 2016, we spent just under three and a half billion dollars, billion dollars, on medications, most of them prescription drugs. So we're pretty concerned with our bodies and our moods, and we are looking for external aids to help us. My point here is that we have bodies that we have to live in. And if our bodies contain our souls, we have to do a good job of caring for them and keeping them healthy. Now that we've figured out the critical pieces of equipment needed for a gospel manual for a soul, let's talk about some of the instructions that would make this work. I would like to suggest we should include a very important step. And the first one, which I think is underrated, is to breathe. Just breathe. We breathe about 26,000 times a day, but we don't really think about this automatic function. We can survive for weeks without food and without water for days, but most of us will only live a few minutes without air. Still, we spend more of our time thinking about what we're going to eat or drink or what we're going to wear. Breathing is seldom considered to be a critical element necessary in our gospel survival manual. Breathing, although it's automatic, is a very complex procedure, and we don't get instructions on it. When we're born, our bodies know how to take a breath. When we die, we take our last breath. God has instilled in our bodies the wisdom to breathe, to follow this instruction. 
whether we want to or not. It's automatic. You might say that God has given our bodies unwritten instructions. We learn in Genesis 7 that breath was our first gift from God. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became, became a living being. When Moses speaks to God for the first time through the burning bush in the desert, he is told to address him using the name Yahweh. Yahweh. God says to Moses, I am Yahweh, the Lord. Yahweh is said with what are called aspirated consonants. That's just a big word for saying breathing sounds. We have add, added the consonants, and we add the sound to this name through our breath. So it's almost as if God is commanding Moses to breathe when he speaks God's name. The gift of breath is so important and so symbolic. It's given again by Jesus when he appears to the disciples on the evening of the resurrection. In John 20, 22, we read that Jesus appeared before 11 of the disciples in a locked room. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Ghost. He breathes on them. Breath and Holy Spirit. What a mystery. In this verse, we get the idea of how powerful an element is breath in our relationship to God and we begin to see it as a mystery. We see the breath of God as corresponding to the giving of the nature of God. Our breath is God's gift to us of himself. We learn here about breath as a vehicle for carrying the spirit. I think this means we can assume that our bodies are meant for sacred duty. When God gives us the breath of the Spirit, we're called into action to carry the gospel, to become embodied spiritual souls. Are you with me? I want to turn back here to the origin of this word breath and its meaning. In Hebrew, the word is ruach. It's actually, it's pronounced ruach, and it's the Hebrew word for spirit or breath or wind. Notice that when this word is spoken, it engages the breath and the lungs. Breath allows us then to enter the portal that takes us across the threshold between the uh, material and the spiritual worlds. This is made clear again when we read in Ezekiel, in verse 37, that the prophet Ezekiel is led by the Spirit of the Lord to prophesy over the dry bones, to declare that they will come to life. The coming back to life of these dry bones is a symbol, a sign of God's sovereignty and the power of the world, over the world. So breath brings us to life in this world, and God's breath brings us into eternal life in the spirit. In Greek, the word pneuma is connected to the word breathe or blow and has a basic meaning of air in motion or breath as something necessary to life. We get the word pneumonia out of this base word. 
Breath is a mysterious gift, one that can cause us to become very ill and one that can give us eternal life. On the downside, again, we get colds, we get pneumonia, lung cancer, lung infections, and as we have all seen over the past three years, we get COVID, which is a breathing disease. This is not a gift to be taken lightly. Breathing is also crucial to our psychological and emotional well-being. Some believe that the world is moving through a collective dark night of the soul. And this is hard on us, on our bodies and our emotions. Fortunately, the field of psychology has kept pace with our need for help in coping with the suffering this has caused us by offering new and better treatment for trauma based on a new understanding of the role of our central nervous system with stress. Ministry is catching up with this knowledge as well. Several weeks ago, Janet Stauffer spoke about Evangelical Seminary's new THD program on trauma and spirituality, and she talked about the vagus nerve. It's an important nerve. This nerve runs from the base of our brains down the spine, and it is a sensory network that tells the brain what's going on in our organs and connects to other nerves, all those nerves. Nerves that involve talking, facial expressions, and even the ability to tune into other people's voices. This nerve is an essential part of the parasympathetic nervous system, and it helps us move from the stressed fight or flight response we find ourselves in during hard times back into a state of serenity. Good mental health is believed to involve working with our vagus nerves so we can move back and forth from stressful situations into calm by breathing. In fact, trauma therapists advise us that breathing is a wonderful way to maintain calm during chaos. Somatic therapist Linda Tai says, when we become upset or afraid, it can throw our central nervous system into a state of dysregulation. We have all been there. We feel this several times a day. We yell, we cry. Sometimes we have physical reactions like shaking. But by using our breath, we can bring ourselves back into regulation just by using our breath. Dr. Tai tells us, breathing is a restorative force that maintains our connection to God and keeps us both alive and able to survive in a time of crisis. Breathing keeps us stable as human beings. What a gift. Let's try it, if you're comfortable doing so. If you're not, that's fine too. Start by sitting in your seat with your spine straight. Make sure your feet are planted on the ground. And if you're comfortable, place one of your hands on your heart, or both, and together we'll take three breaths. Three is the magic number. One breath in to descend to the heart, a second one to connect to the soul, and a third breath to rise up in a big exhale and know that we are in union with God. You ready? This is how Jesus rose off the cross. Did you feel that? I hope you did. Try to think of this as a shortcut 
for calming down and connecting yourself to God and use it as often as you can. I do this a lot, my husband will tell you. In fact, I say it to him a lot, breathe. Are you ready? We're going to breathe together. <laughs> Praying is another wonderful way to call to, out to the divine and to still ourselves, especially when we pray what is described as a breath prayer. Christine Baltner's painter is an abbess and poet, and she writes in her book, Breath Prayer, when we pray with the rhythm of breath, it provides us an anchor in the midst of whatever we are doing. Breath is our constant companion, as is our heartbeat. And these gentle risings and fallings offer us the gift of a kind of scaffolding for our prayers. There are lots of many, many forms of breath prayer in Christianity and in other faith traditions. The most famous is the Jesus prayer. But the important thing about breath and prayer is to remember that breath is a holy gift. Breathing deeply as we turn inward into our souls allows us to feel the presence of God. When we do this, I believe we're following what is the most important step in the Gospel manual. Praying and breath work shows God our acceptance and helps us maintain a connection with him. Since I'm a writer, I'd be really remiss if I didn't tell you what artists and poets and musicians have to say about breathing. Author and songwriter Jason Gray has written an article called, Is the Name of God the Sound of Our Breathing? Gray says we do take this gift of breath for granted. And then he says, when I think about it, breathing looks almost like a kind of praying. Breathing looks almost like a kind of praying. Poet Gary Snyder says, where you breathe, you bow. Where you breathe, you bow. This makes it simple to remember, and that's my kind of instruction manual. We don't have to carry this manual around with us. It is embodied, like our spirituality. We don't have to check to see if we followed the instructions correctly in this manual. Because if we are breathing, we are living into the gospel. I'd like to also look at what my favorite poet, David White, has to say about breathing. In his poem, Breathe Then as if breathing for the first time. Breathe then, as if breathing for the first time. As if remembering with what difficulty you came into this world, what strength it took to turn that first impossible in-breath into a cry to be heard by the world. In that first breath and cry, we announce our connection to the kingdom of God on earth. Now, I don't want to suggest any of this is simple to do. It's very difficult to live with fully with joy in these times, to live a Christ-like life, but I would like to remind you that humanity has been here before. We have lived through devastation. We've lived through traumatic, historic times as a people. We were made for these times. We have bodies that carry our souls. We have a gospel manual with a sacred instruction that we are required to follow. Let's consider another time in our spiritual history when the world was shattered. The time of the crucifixion of Jesus. This loss took away the breath of the world. 
Those who witnessed it and lived it didn't know how to respond or what to do. It was astounding. And when I let myself really think about it, it takes away my breath. To make this a more personal point, I'm gonna ask you to use your imagination for a minute. Let's go back to that time and remember this crucifixion. I'm gonna ask you to imagine yourself at the scene of the tomb on that holy Saturday, the evening after Jesus' death. And imagine that you're sitting next to Mary Magdalene and the other Marys who are facing the tomb, struggling with despair. What were they doing, the Marys, on the day after the crucifixion, the day between the dying and the rising? What were they doing? The only thing they could do in the face of this tragedy, they were breathing. In her poem, Jan Richardson opens on this scene with these lines. For Holy Saturday, it's titled. Let it be on this day, we will expect no more of ourselves than to keep breathing with the bewildered cadence of lungs that will not give up the ghost. Let it be, we will expect little but the beating of our heart, stubborn in its repeating rhythm that will not cease to sound. Let it be that we will still ourselves enough to hear what may yet come to echo as if in the breath, another breathing, as if in the heartbeat, another heart. Let it be, we will not try to fathom what comes to meet us in the stillness, but simply open to the approach of a mystery we hardly dared to dream. What the world didn't know on that terrible evening was the gift that was to come the next morning when Jesus became the risen Christ. He was able to transform from incarnated human divine being, breaking free of the bonds of death and eternal life. We don't have an instruction, an explicit one for this step but we know it was the result of a union with God and that Jesus ascended into a spiritual realm. And he left us with a spiritual blueprint to follow. So breathe, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Jane. You know, it's the things that we take for granted, right? We take those things for granted. And we have to remember that God has given us everything we need to live this life, right? Yeah. And to simply, I do that a lot. You ever do it? I think I've done it to some of you already. To just say, stop a minute, breathe. Because it does do something when it just calms us down. It kind of brings us back to center. And it's a good reminder. So thank you, Jane. Thank you for being with us here this morning. Thank you again for a wonderful week of VBA. Stay cool. Take care of yourselves in this heat. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>